Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Greg Zipfel. I'm the head and uh, professor of neurosurgery at Washington University in St. Louis. You are listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Greg Zipfel, Chair of Neurosurgery at Washington University in St. Louis. His surgical practice is focused on cerebral vascular disease and complex tumors that grow near the base of the skull. He is known for his expertise in surgically correcting aneurysms and other blood vessel malformations in the brain, removing complicated tumors near the skull base and creating surgical bypasses around blocked or diseased arteries of the brain to increase blood supply. As co-director of the Stroke and Cerebral Vascular Center at Barnes Jewish Hospital, Dr. Zipfel has worked with colleagues to develop integrated multidisciplinary patient care that has improved outcomes and access for patients. A dedicated educator and mentor, Dr. Zipfel directs the neurosurgery residency program at Barnes Jewish Hospital, where he has initiated the refined curriculum and mentoring programs. He also serves as the National Director of Resident Courses for the Society of Neurological Surgeons and founded a mentorship program for early career researchers through the American Academy of Neurological Surgeons. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Greg Zipfel, Chair of Neurosurgery at WashU. Doc, how are we doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being with us. So let's get this started. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how have those changed throughout your fellowship? Yeah, well, I came into residency um, really uh, wanting to, you know, be the best I could be. Um, And I think that evolved during residency uh, and a little bit during fellowship. uh, uh, But early on, I identified a mentor um, that really impacted me. Uh, His name is Art Day, um, who is well known in academic neurosurgical circles. And um, I just really liked what he was doing with his life and with his practice and how he was helping people and how he was from my perspective, uh, helping change the specialty, you know, for the good. And I realized early on that I wanted to have opportunities, something similar to that. So um, I I had pretty high aspirations for my career, but I think they were enhanced uh, by a mentor who I uh, really felt that uh, uh, gave me even uh, kind of set the site, the heights even higher in terms of what I could achieve. And from there, I, I just, you know, started each day, each week, each month, you know, trying to work towards that ultimate goal uh, of, uh, at that time, getting a top tier uh, uh, faculty position at a great medical center that I could then launch my academic career. So kind of taking us through that fellowship year, you know, what was your mentality heading into your first job search and how that perspective changed the beginning years of your career? Sure. Well, for me, fellowship, I knew what I wanted to do by then for sure. And so fellowship for me was really just trying to polishing off of some uh, uh, technical skills that I wanted to develop in the area of cerebrovascular uh, and skull-based surgery, and also making important connections with additional uh, mentors that can uh, really impact and help your career. And then, uh, and then, I, and then certainly during that time, I was uh, working hard on the job search. I actually started my job search uh, midway through my chief residency year. Um, so prior to my fellowship, and uh, what I did is I, I actually just went to the went to the internet and uh, I, I looked up a, a whole bunch of uh, departments that uh, were in areas of the country that I uh, uh, you know looked looked like areas that I would be interested in, which I actually cast a very wide net because I knew that the kind of job I wanted would not necessarily uh, always be exactly in one location of the country or another. So I, I cast a wide net. And I, and I looked at these uh, at the websites of the different departments, and I tried to figure out, do they potentially have room for another cerebrovascular surgeon? And does that department have uh, expertise or a track record in uh, an area that I want to develop, which was uh, you know, fundamental laboratory research and, and really uh, doing transformative science to help uh, uh, improve care of cerebrovascular patients over time? So I really wanted that combination of a little bit of geography that was important to me, but mainly do they have room for another uh, cerebrovascular surgeon? Uh, and do they have a track record of uh, uh, producing successfully academic neurosurgeons? And from there, I, I created a list um, and I, uh, I emailed uh, all, these, all of them uh, and um, had, a, uh, had my CV and had an attached cover letter. And, and from there, I was kind of off and, and, and rolling in terms of places that may have an opportunity. But the key there was, it wasn't that, um, necessarily they even knew that they needed somebody or, or could accommodate somebody. Um, I, I kind of felt like I needed to find places that once they know who I was and what I could bring to the table, some places might even create a place uh, for me uh, 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 rather than a, a glaring hole that they were trying to fill. Now throughout that process, did you ever consider going private practice or were you really academic focused all the way? I was academic the whole way. What would you say were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career as you climbed the ranks of the academic industry? 
Well, um, I think that I had some really good uh, mentoring and advice that I took along the way as a resident and fellow that prepared me for the first few years of my faculty uh, career. And the keys there for the kind of thing I wanted to do, which was to become a surgeon scientist and make impact uh, academically, is that though I knew that the first three to five years were critical and I needed to take a, a, you know, kind of ownership of those three to five years and really prepare myself uh, in some ways emotionally uh, to, to making sure I made the right decision. So what I mean by that is, you know, neurosurgeons go through an awful lot of training, a lot of years to get to a point where you're really an expert in taking care of certain surgical diseases. And it's natural for you to want to operate a lot um, and because you went through all this training and you have the skill set. But it turns out in academics, especially if you want to be a, a, you know, a, a, an investigator, you need to focus a lot of time on the lab early on. Um, and so that takes you getting somewhere emotionally uh, uh, where you are able to say, I'm going to have a modest surgical practice, uh, hopefully focused in your area of expertise, uh, but I'm not going to be the busiest uh, surgeon in my department uh, at, at the outset. But that's critical foundation building for you, so you have the time to develop your academic career. And, and I took you know, uh, 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 advice from some of my mentors, one of which often said, you know, uh, in the first few years, you, know, you, you, know, you gotta be careful with your clinical practice because once you develop a really big, robust clinical practice, have that kind of referral reputation, uh, it takes on a life of its own. Uh, and so early on, I focused a lot of effort the first few years on my academic pursuits and then once those started taking shape and, and were going in the right direction, then I started spending more time on my own clinical practice, but also started transitioning into um, uh, 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 leadership uh, across my medical center and developing uh, an area uh, broader than my own practice, you know, working on uh, a service line uh, that, that related to my expertise. So for me, that meant helping uh, found and, and develop a, a stroke and cerebrovascular center for my institution. Speaking of leadership, can you kind of take us through the journey that allowed you to become chair of the program? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that early on, um, it's probably best not to think a lot about uh, um, all some of the specific, some of the specific things that you may need ultimately to become a chair or, or, or achieve that type of uh, position. I think early on, you need to develop your own practice. You need to develop your own academic programs and research programs. And really, you know, make some serious contributions uh, early on. Once you have that kind of foundation, uh, then you can build upon that. Um, and I, I think building upon that is in a few different things. One is, I think locally, uh, you, you need to find ways that you can show that you have leadership and, and, uh, and you develop a, a style and then you develop a, a track record of success that you can then um, utilize to show uh, 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 chair searched committees that you can build a program, that you can lead, that you can uh, 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 you know, develop interdepartmental uh, uh, a successful program. So I, I look for that. And the two areas for me were one, I, I ultimately became the residency program director. So I led you know, a, a, you know, a really robust uh, uh, education program for the Department of Neurosurgery. And I learned an awful lot about how to team build and develop culture and to mentor and foster careers. And that really served me well for you know, uh, the process of uh, obtaining a chair position and, uh, and then also being an effective chair. I also had this opportunity to uh, found and then co-lead a stroke and cerebrovascular center uh, in which I worked across departmental lines with neurology and radiology and the emergency medicine department and with hospital leadership. And that also was an important uh, uh, kind of formative leadership experience that, that I had that also served me well as I pursued a chair job. And then lastly, you know, I, I, uh, over time, not early on, but over time, you know, I sought out uh, uh, national leadership roles within organized neurosurgery. And I think the culmination or, or the accumulation of those experiences really uh, helped me prepare for leadership. As a leader, what advice do you have for the graduating residents and fellows entering the professional job market for the first time? Well, I, I think uh, you, you, you want to match um, your career aspirations, uh, your personal, uh, uh, what's, what's important to you personally uh, with the job opportunities that you're being confronted with or, or you're seeking out um, and, and not be uh, too enamored by an initial salary or uh, some other kind of bells and whistles that may seem really enticing and important early on, but aren't the foundational pieces upon which you're gonna have success in your career. So 
you got to figure that out. Uh, uh, for some people, that means they really want to. Uh, um, what's important to them is is is, uh, is having autonomy and independence really early on, and um, and they want to take care of patients and and they want to serve a community. Well, those people would be really well served to find a smaller practice uh, uh, where you can quickly be kind of the uh, you know the, you know the lead of of that practice and serve a community uh, uh, and and develop a really nice clinical practice and take care of patients in the areas that you that that's important to you and and then you know, you you know, you know imprint upon that whatever your personal uh, uh, needs are in terms of where you want to live and what kind of community you want to be in and where your family is and things like that for other people they want to they want a bigger practice they they they, they it's important to them to be uh, uh, with a, a lot of partners who have a lot of different expertise and a lot of different backgrounds and maybe they subspecialize uh, in the kind of neurosurgical care that they provide uh, but they also want to continue to, you know, to really focus primarily on patient care. Well, that, those kind of individuals want to look for a, a bigger practice uh, um, that, uh, you know, where there's, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine partners, and you can subspecialize and you can feed off each other uh, and synergize and you can learn from more senior members. And so that's important to you. And then obviously there are other people who really want to be in, a, in an academic setting but even there, there's a lot of different variations on that. Some people are really hardcore scientists, and, and that's why they're in it. They want to do research at a high level, and they, and they need to be at an academic medical center for it. Other people want to be in academics because they want to, uh, they want to be educators. They, it's really important to them to be involved with resident and fellow uh, training and, and medical students and things like that. And that really is what turns them on to an academic uh, uh, setting. And there are definitely really strong academic positions available uh, where that can be a, an area of focus. And then some people just really want to uh, be in a position uh, that they can really hone in on a really specific area of neurosurgery. Uh, and oftentimes academic medical centers offer that opportunity. So if you want to be a, a really busy epilepsy surgeon, well, you know, there are some private practices um, that are big enough that they can do that. But, uh, but academic medical centers are definitely an area that you can, can develop that kind of practice. And, and then, you know, so those are some of the things uh, that, that I think people should be thinking about as they are, are thinking about what type of job they want. But but the initial salary and, uh, uh, and things like that mean less. You really want to look into what kind of practice you want. And I didn't mention it, but I'll mention it now. You know, you, you, want, you want a good partnership with the hospital, partnership with, your, uh, uh, with the other neurosurgeons in your group. Uh, you want to feel good about uh, that in, environment. And that's something that's going to be, you know, fostering and, and mentoring and, and uh, you know, promoting your career. And if you don't feel that, uh, even if the salary looked great, you know, uh, th th there's a problem there and, and you really want to sort that out before you commit someplace. Now with 2020 being this pandemic situational year, you know, a lot of the conferences have gone online, so it's all virtual. So what advice do you have for the graduating class regarding their networking and outreaching process since they don't have the ability to meet folks like yourself at meetings? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, you know, um, I think for networking to try to identify jobs, you know, I think it depends on what the kind of job that you're looking for. Um, I think that uh, uh, I think um, for a lot of private practice jobs, I think that that, that uh, recruitment uh, uh, companies and, and people who specialize in that, you know, play a really important role. Uh, and uh, in fact, in fact, you know, we're, we're doing some uh, development ourselves uh, of community practices in our uh, in our healthcare system. And we're utilizing that those kind of companies to identify that type of, uh, of neurosurgeon. I think that is very important. I think that within um, uh, academics, uh, I think that that is less commonly used, although that could be changing over time. Um, and so I think understanding, you know, what type of job you're looking for and, and, and availing uh, yourself of the resources available for that type of job are important. That could be a recruiting firm. Uh, but, in, but another one is, and this is probably not uh, uh, related to private practice or uh, academics or, or a hybrid, uh, I think mentorship and the people that who've trained you and people who are out in the community are going to be really important uh, uh, to helping you identify a great job. So I think people within your uh, department that you trained under can help, whether no matter what type of job you're looking for. I think that past graduates, alumni from your program, or people you've connected with in other ways, maybe from medical school or, uh, or elsewhere, those are important resources to also uh, uh, leverage to try to identify uh, opportunities. And, and also, once you're in kind of evaluation mode, vet opportunities. So in terms of, you know, once you start, once you identify opportunities and you're in the recruitment, you're, in, you're kind of in recruiting mode and you're, and you're evaluating these different opportunities, 
you know, COVID put some challenges on that. A lot of people are doing uh, a, a initial looks through Zoom, and I, I think that's a great way, an efficient way, and and uh, to to you know quickly assess whether this is an opportunity that you may be interested in. And uh, and I would encourage you to do that. And I think a lot of departments around the country, and I'm sure a lot of practices around the country, are kind of getting used to that type of uh, uh, interview process. We're doing a lot of it at my institution. But I do think um, that uh, eventually when you get serious about a place, if at all possible, you're gonna need to get there, uh, I think, physically, and look at the city, look at the hospital, meet with some key people. Um, and if that's at all possible, and I think most places it's, it still is, uh, when you're getting down to your final decision-making, I think you know, really you know, meeting these people and seeing the environment uh, is gonna be critical. So I think it's a, it's a two-stage thing nowadays, a lot of Zoom, a lot of, uh, uh, virtual uh, initial interviews, uh, but then when you get down to the really the final decision making, I, I think you can't substitute a personal interaction uh, uh, if at all possible. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.